talk a little bit about this uh, and get some some excitement built up for the longest path. Okay, and we'll 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 pick up wherever we leave off. So we've done a lot of shortest walk, shortest path problems. Uh, this can be skipped. Okay. So we're going to do something that seems almost like the same problem. So the question is uh, the longest path in a graph, or maybe a, a special case could be uh, I fix some vertex S and I say, okay, what is the longest path starting from S? Or I can give you S and T and say, what's the longest path from S to T? We did shortest path, this is just longest. Okay. Um, a special case, I mean, there's something called a Hamiltonian path. This is a path that visits everything. A Hamiltonian cycle, some cycle that visits everything. These are all kind of very similar problems. So you might ask, okay, does G have a Hamiltonian path? Okay. Um, okay. Maybe we can just stare at this. What is the long length of the longest path from S? One. S is the oh well it can go anywhere you want I can choose one I can either say to any vertex or I'll I'll choose T here ah it's not infinity because there's a cycle because the path so it's always finite um. All right, what do people come up? What's the longest uh, ST path you've come up with in this graph? Six, anyone do better than six? All right, tell me how you did six, I don't know. Okay, should I go left, right, or down, right? Left? Should I go, I guess you have to go down, otherwise you're screwed. Okay, should I go up and to the right or down and to the right? Okay, uh, here we only have one choice. Uh, oh, you only have one choice, and one choice is what people came up with. Anyone do better? Okay, it seems harder, at least to me. Um, it's also not clear how to prove that this is the longest one. All right, so we have just enough time for a wonderful poll. Okay, so. We're going to look at this problem in three different settings. One is a DAG. That means there's no cycles in the graph. Okay. The other is a general directed graph. And the other is an undirected graph. Undirected means that every edge can go either direction. So, and you have three choices. You can not vote, or you can say that there's an algorithm, or there's probably not an algorithm. Or at least an algorithm would imply an algorithm for SAT. All right, so who's not voting? Two people. Okay. All right, um, I'll do one row at a time. So who thinks in a DAG we can come up with an algorithm for this problem? Okay, I would say that's, that's most people. Okay, and uh, who thinks it's gonna turn out to be hard? Okay. Usual, the numbers don't remotely add up. Um, all right, take a now directed graph. Who thinks we'll be able to get an algorithm for this problem? Okay. And who thinks it's going to turn out to be tough? Okay, slightly more. Okay. And now an undirected graph. Who thinks we'll get an, under, an algorithm for an undirected graph? Okay, okay like ten percent. And who thinks that undirected will also be hard? Uh, so I would say like fifty-three and a half. Okay. All right. So first of all, 
Does this even make sense? Okay, this makes some sense. A DAG is a special case of a directed graph. So uh, it is quite possible to get an algorithm for this, but not an algorithm for this. That's possible, because an algorithm for this does not imply an algorithm for this, but an algorithm for this would imply an algorithm for this. So that's good. Um, same also uh, with here. An undirected graph, I could take every undirected edge and replace it with two directed edges in both directions. So an algorithm here would imply an algorithm here, but an algorithm here would not necessarily imply an algorithm here. So that's also correct. So I would say directionally, we're doing okay. So this is better than when we did uh, two sat on, on Monday or something. Um, and we'll just have to find out on Friday what will happen to each of these problems. Okay, thanks guys. Okay, then I'll, I'll, I'll first get us back up to speed. Well, a few more people trickle in. So we're looking at this longest path problem. Actually, we only just started discussing it. So this is, uh, you know, following up on, so we've been looking at hard problems, sometimes easy, we can do two sat. But in general, we've started to consider the possibility that some problems, how are easy, easy to state, may not actually be easy to solve. And in fact, the distinction seems to be subtle because somehow there's a world of difference between two sat and max two sat. I cannot clearly articulate what the difference is beyond what we've shown, that we have an algorithm for one and a reduction for the other. So, so uh, another problem that's sort of in this gray zone is this longest path problem. Uh, there's many ways I can ask it. Maybe in one version I give you S and T and I ask you for the longest path from S to T, or I give you just S and you find the longest path starting for S. I don't even give you S and I say, give me the longest path from anywhere. But of course, if you can solve S, you can figure it out from anywhere because you can try all S's. If you could do S and T, then you can figure out S by trying all T's and stuff. So uh, often these problems are, are somewhat similar. And uh, okay, so obviously this is awfully similar to the shortest path stuff we did before the midterm. And uh, we took a, a poll for, for a couple different settings, one is an acyclic graph, one is a general directed graph, one is an undirected graph. And, uh, and the feeling was that, okay, if anyone is going to be easy, it's going to be a the, poly, uh, the DAG setting. And then most people who voted thought it was going to be hard to do the directed setting. And then most people still thought the undirected would be hard, but a few people flipped back. Okay, which is certainly possible because undirected does not necessarily solve directed. Okay, so this this makes sense except for the usual missing 35%. Uh, the, the results make sense. Okay, all right, so I'll start at the, the top. So uh, longest path uh, in a DAG, right? So all you're told is that uh, there's no cycles. Right? So, okay. So for what it's worth, if there's no cycles, then every walk is a path. So we could have at least rewritten this a little bit. Like this, right? Th those questions are somewhat equivalent here. Okay. All right. Uh, does anyone have any ideas for either trying to show this is hard? or coming up with an algorithm. You don't have to describe a whole algorithm, just like ideas to get us going. Okay, so I'm gonna run some kind of breath first search, maybe from here or something and uh, every time I find a longer path of vertex, I kind of I kind of update the label and then keep searching from there. Okay, okay. Uh, so breath first search, but like 
the opposite almost. You want you want to remark everything every time you find something better. So I guess at the very least that algorithm should take like mn time because uh, each vertex should only have its distance label increase at most n times because uh, n is the biggest in breadth first search. Um, uh, so then maybe that'll be mn time, but then we'd also have to argue that it works. Like, you know, you might get stuck, but it's not clear that you've exhausted all the long paths. Right. Uh, the algorithm will halt. I'm trying to figure out how to argue that it's actually correct. Yeah. All right. At the very least, it requires thinking. But it's not a bad idea. Any other ideas? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so let's say let's say for simplicity I want to do longest path from here. Okay, can we do something with topological sort? It is a DAG. So I know that I can write the graph always secretly has some form like this. Uh where all the edges are going this way. All right, maybe you're starting from uh here or something. All right. Okay, so if we kind of work through that, you know, I know that I'm not going to be using this vertex because it's on the left. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So, so you might ask, okay, how do I get the longest path from here? Right? And then, you know, let's say that this has uh, two edges like this or something. And then, you know, then it's going to be like one plus uh, maybe the better of these two or something like this. But at least visually, you can see we're going down some kind of sequence. Uh, so maybe we can do something like longest increasing subsequence or something like this. So the, these DAGs are graphs that, that are actually sequential in some sense, right? So maybe we can try to do some kind of recursive algorithm, right? And then because there's the sequence nature, we can just save the answers and and get you know the full expression of a brute force-ish recursive algorithm, but you know super fast because it's marching down a sequence. So, okay, that means we should make a sentence first, okay? Because that's what we do in this class. So uh, I I, uh, I went ahead and get us started. So uh, I wrote LW for longest walk. Maybe starting from a vertex V, we could potentially add more parameters if we need to. So what what should we implement? What's the sentence? What are we trying to? What would be the recursive spec? I may or may not have just said it out loud. Yeah. Oh, we could do that. We can do that too. Okay. So you want to do the longest walk or length of longest walk from V to W, for example. Okay. Um, fine. And then if I wanted to implement this, right? So maybe V is here and you know W is here or something. Yeah. Uh, oh, but maybe that should be negative infinity. Because we want the longest, so kind of the negation. So all right, or negative infinity if impossible. That will signal, okay, or throw an error or something. Okay, so how could we implement this? Yeah. Okay, so something like uh, 
Uh, maybe I'll write supremum in case there's the negative infinity stuff, um, which is the same as max essentially. Uh, so you're saying one plus longest walk from V to, I don't know, X for all, I guess, edges of the form XW. So this might be an example of X. Okay. That would be okay. Uh, I think for an inductive case, what would be a base case? Okay. So I guess, you know, you could be done, right? So if V is equal to W, you should return zero. And otherwise you would search or something. Uh, and I guess kind of built into the supremum is that if there are no edges coming in, this is automatically negative infinity, just like how the infimum of an empty set is positive infinity. Otherwise, you can write out explicitly, oh, if, if, if uh, W is a source, then the answer is negative infinity. Otherwise, return to max. It would be the same. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. Uh, I think that's fine. Uh, maybe one thing. Yeah, okay. That's, that's fine. So this is very similar to what I had in mind. Unfortunately, I went slightly different direction, but same, same general idea. Uh, I guess I was originally just looking for the longest walk in, in the graph from anywhere to anywhere. Um, and so this is similar, kind of going the opposite direction. So I'm starting from V and, uh, you know, exploring the, the edges that leave V. Okay. Or here I wrote zero if it's a sink and otherwise. So this is, this is going from V and growing outwards. Okay. Good. So, so, okay. So now let's try to figure out the running time of this algorithm, which itself is sort of brute forcey, but we can save our answers. Okay. I can actually apply. This is the key point. Uh, so as I move from left to right, you know, when I solve this sub problem, I can just save the answer. There's no chance of kind of cycling back. Right. So on a DAG, you can actually write a recursive algorithm and apply dynamic programming, right, for free. In fact, you can think of all our sequential problems as special cases of DAGs, in a sense that if I kind of thought of each subproblem as a node with an edge to other subproblems it depends on, you know, we didn't have any infinite cycles, right? So that's like saying it's a DAG over this kind of problem space. Uh, all right, anyway, so let's try to calculate how fast or slow this algorithm is. So I'm summing over all the vertices, the time spent solving the subproblem at V, excluding the recursive subcalls. So for a particular V, what would it be? How much time do we spend? Yeah, okay, so why is the M plus N? Yeah, so the bottleneck is one plus a loop over its out degree, you know, outgoing edges. So this loop is going to take time proportional to its out degree. So this is one of those where you can sum up over all the edges in a graph. We've done these before, right? Okay, so you get something like this. And this, again, you add up all the out degrees, and that'll get you m. Okay, so you get an m plus n time algorithm. Right, so you can actually do a longest walk in a DAG or variations of this, maybe from S to T or something, uh, as fast as you possibly want to or could hope for. Okay, okay great. Good. Um, that's excellent. Now, okay, so before moving on, I want to make this point explicit. This will come up a lot because this is a great way to generate, you know, those ridiculous problems. So, so the key point about DAGs is that this topological ordering suddenly lets you do induction and recursion directly, right? Because there's no cycles. So you have this kind of very safe uh, subproblem structure. Uh, that means we can use our favorite, I don't know if it's our favorite, but we can use dynamic programming, right? And you get these fast algorithms immediately. And, uh, 
And, and one of the themes is that, okay, you know, problems that might be very hard in general graphs can potentially be much easier in DAGs because you can actually basically do brute force, right? Brute force can be made efficient is how I think of dynamic programming. Okay, so yeah, there will be no shortage of very long stories about nonsense where you need to figure out the underlying DAG and turn it, you know, turn that into, okay? All right. So, and at some level, you can see this as sort of the limit of all these sequential problems and stuff we were doing. This is just even more general. Okay, good. So, uh, that addresses uh, DAGs. All right, so DAGs turn out to be, yeah. Can you do something like an, a, a more greedy algorithm? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, you have to be careful. Uh, so di proving Dijkstra's algorithm was not that easy. And we had to really clearly establish that once I figured out the closest vertex, I would never have to revise it. So here, I don't know, you can imagine trying to find like the first farthest vertex, I guess, but finding the furthest, it's, yeah, it's not obvious to me, you know, because maybe I'm just trying to imagine what an algorithm might look like. You know, you're at you're at you know s or something, and here's some vertex, and there's two ways to get there. One is a really long circuitous route, right? And this is going to take a little while for the algorithm to explore and figure out that you should go here the long way instead of the short way and things like this. So it felt like when with, 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 this is only, you know, loosely speaking, this isn't very formal, but it felt like with Dijkstra, with the shortest thing, there was a natural way to build up a solution. Whereas with the longest, it's not obvious how to order things and make it efficient. Yeah. Yes, we could have, we could have uh, made every edge weight negative one and then looked for the shortest walk in the graph. So we, we were actually able to do this faster than we would have gotten from Bellman Ford, but maybe we should have at least mentioned Bellman Ford earlier. Yeah, so you could have negated the edges. So actually you can imagine if I put edge weights on this graph, positive or negative, you might be able to you know compute all the distances rather fast. Okay. That might be given as an exercise at some point. Okay. Other questions? So DAGs are your friend, at least if you're trying to make algorithms. Okay. So, okay, uh, I guess I put this here in case anybody wanted to change their vote or change their mind because DAGs turned out to be super duper easy. Okay, uh, I can't tell if anyone's excited to vote, but we'll find out. Who's not going, so I'm gonna ask again, uh, for directed graphs, if you think there will be a polynomial time algorithm, or if it will turn out to be hard, or if you're going to abstain, given the fact that this was so easy. Okay. So who's not going to vote? Okay. Oh, every second one more person raises their hand. Okay. Uh, okay, who thinks we can get an algorithm? Oh, okay. We, we've gone from, we've gone down. Uh, who thinks it's going to turn out to be hard? Okay, so that's like... Okay. Um, okay, so somehow we... Maybe you guys know that I'm going to zigzag. All right, so um, finding the longest path problem uh, is more or less the same as... A, a special case is, is there a path visiting all the vertices? Right, that would be the maximum length of n minus one edges and n vertices. Uh, so if you can show that this problem is hard, that shows that finding the longest path is also hard. Okay, because if you could find the longest path, then you could find if there's a Hamiltonian path. I'll focus on this because that's what, uh, I don't know. Sometimes when you're trying to show something is, yeah. It might not have a Hamiltonian path. 
Huh? That's right. So I want to show the longest path is hard. So the question is whether longest path can solve the question of does G have a Hamiltonian path? Because we're doing the uh, we're doing hardness, so it flips. Yeah. I, I make that mis I mean I do that all the time too. Okay. Um, right. Okay, so this is what we're gonna try to show. This is the schematic. So we're gonna try to show that Hamiltonian path can solve SAT. Actually, we'll yeah, maybe three SAT for simplicity, but just SAT something in conjunctive normal form. So somehow, just to remind us, we're gonna assume we have a black box to solve Hamiltonian path. I want to show that this black box is probably too good to be true. So we say, well, what if it did exist? If I can take a three SAT formula, turn it into a directed graph, for which whether or not the directed graph has a Hamiltonian path tells you whether or not the formula is satisfiable, then this 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 black box may just be a fantasy. Okay. So that's the that's the idea. And this is a more radical than before, or I don't know. I don't know if it's more radical or less radical than subset sum. It or I thought it was already a stretch to use subset sum to solve formulas. Now we're going to try to use these simple graphs, which are just you know dots and lines, to solve Boolean formulas. Okay. So uh, maybe before I start showing slides, anyone want to take a stab at it? I see some active no's. Do not want to take a stab at it. Unless these are Indian yeses, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I can try to map... Uh, Uh, each clause to a node. So that means I'm going to have like various nodes corresponding to clauses. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's at least like a good pattern match. Hamiltonian path is you have to visit all the vertices. And SAT says you have to sat, uh, satisfy all the clauses. So, so at some level, clauses should map to vertices. Yeah. Now, maybe for another part, yeah, maybe I can egg you guys on more. Um, you have to make decisions in this problem. And you have to make decisions in this problem. So somehow, how do I encode setting x1 to be true? or x1 to be false as like a decision in graph world. Yeah. Okay. This will like visit here and here. I mean, this will go like this because that clause is x1 equal false or something. Okay, I think that's a reasonable idea. So again, decisions are again nodes. Now, a couple things to point out. So this clause needs x1 to be true and x1 to be true. Hamiltonian passage, you can only visit this vertex once. So you visit this vertex once because you want to say x1 is equal to true. And then somehow you have to choose which of the two clauses you satisfy. That seems tough. You want to be able to satisfy both. This is a good idea, but this is just some, some immediate issues. A second issue is that it says that we're supposed to visit all the vertices. And you probably don't want to visit x1 equal true and x1 equal false.
Yeah. Okay, so can I can I try connecting clauses that share variables or share literals? Um, yeah, you have to be a little bit careful. Maybe you visit this vertex because x1 is equal to true, and you go here because they both had x2, and then you go here because this has they both have x3, and this one has x1 equal to false, and you go to the next one because x1 is equal to false or something. If you're not careful, it feels like you can take the edge for one reason and take an edge for another. The op I mean, the counter reason. Okay, here's a, or anyone, anyone want to try more? This one is exceedingly clever. Okay, so, all right, so the basic question is how do I model this binary decision graphically? with a graph okay so we've had this idea of oh can we make it a node or something we're going to do something a little bit different okay so for each vertex i'm going to make a long bi-directed path okay we'll see why it's helpful to have intermediate vertices later but if i make a long path like this and i know i have to visit each vertex and I can only visit it once. Then any Hamiltonian path will have to go this way or this way, right? So if I set up this long path, you know, within the restrictions of this Hamiltonian path framework, then I can treat the direction as encoding some kind of decision. Okay. Uh, so that's that's sort of uh, the key, one of the key gadgets to get us started. Okay, to try to program binary decisions into a graph and to sort of, what we'll do is we'll hook them all up. Okay, so you have one path for each variable. And so this is already set up where like a Hamiltonian path sort of has to stop, start at the top of a ladder, one of the two corners, and it needs to work its way down going through every single uh, step of the ladder. And with each one, it can those those light blue cross edges let you choose. Oh, for next variable, do you want to set x1 to be true or do you want to set x1 to be false? Do you want to set x2 to be true, x2 to be false? Okay, so so we have uh, that's sort of like the the skeleton, so that we can at least encode uh, decisions. Okay, good. And now, okay. So, all right, so now the next question is, how do we want to model clauses? Okay, so you kind of have some scaffolding where you can interpret x1 to be true and x1 to be false or something based on directions, one of the two directions. Now for a clause, we want to figure out how to extend, you know, right? So that you should only be able to visit the clause when you took one of the two variables in the right direction, or something like this, right? So how can we integrate clauses into this construction? This one is maybe more guessable. So an earlier suggestion was on the right track. Maybe we should introduce a vertex for a clause that we can only visit if we sort of did the right things to actually satisfy the clause. So if I told you we're going to introduce a vertex, I mean, let me zoom in. So. 
All right. I guess we're zooming into here. Okay. So we're going to make a new vertex. Okay, for this say example clause, not x1 or x2. And I, I drew it in between the two legs of you know rungs of that ladder. Okay. And I want to be able to only visit that vertex itself if I'm going in the appropriate direction. All right, so you want me to draw edges. Where should I draw the edge? The leftmost? Here to here. Okay, I'll undo that. Okay, something like this. So I can imagine, okay, I've made the right decision. I'm doing x1 equals zero, so I'm gonna go this way. And along the way, I can make a pit stop, check off this, this vertex and continue. I guess that's the idea. Okay. All right, so that addresses x1. And what about x2? Same idea, so it's only in the opposite direction, right? So. I add these two edges, I'm just making this, this pit stop. So, so if I if we make uh, edges like this, then that new vertex can only be visited if we're going in the right direction. Okay. Not only that, but you do not want to go like here to here because you'll never be able to get back up the ladder. You can only go down. So the Hamiltonian path will, if it goes here, it needs to, it needs to exit right away to have any chance. Same with here needs to exit right away because it should have already visited. Okay. All right. Um, good. Good. So you can you can set up you know these connections between rungs like this. Okay. And it's helpful to put like a little extra space in between here and that'll make sure that they have to get back on the track to visit things. Yeah. So what was the question? Oh, because one direction is, is for x1 equals 0. Uh, x1 equals 0 goes this way. x1 equals 1 goes that way. x2 equals 0 goes this way. x2 equals 1 goes that way. Uh, so, so the Hamiltonian path has, is committed, has to commit to some direction along each one. And it'll make a choice. The black box will make the best possible choice. Okay, so. Okay, if you put all these together, then, you know, the Hamiltonian can path can choose whichever corner it wants to start with, and it needs to make it the whole way down. It needs to visit these clauses along the way, which it can only do if it goes in the correct direction. So in this graph, we end up with something like MN vertices or something. This this only needs to be like as long as as there are clauses. So you have kind of space without colliding. And yeah, that's it. That's the construction. Okay. So uh, what you want to do is you want to map uh, in a full proof. You say, oh, if I have a satisfying assignment. I'm going to make a path like this that visits everything. If I have paths that visits everything, I'll turn that into an assignment. It's done more slowly in the notes, I think. Okay, good. Uh, any questions? Yeah.
Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, so to, to solidify, ultimately we want to show that this can be satisfied if and only if there's a Hamiltonian path here. Okay, so if we, if we did it more slowly, say, okay, suppose I have a satisfying assignment here. So x1 is equal to true, x2 is equal to false, something like this. Then, okay, I'm going to make a Hamiltonian path where I'm going to do x1 is equal to true and x2 is equal to false or something. I mean, I'm going to start making a path. And for each clause, like this one, that's satisfied by x1 equal to true, I'll adjust my, my, my path, you know, when it's about to, I guess it's going this way, when it's going to visit, uh, to visit the clause along the way. So I will take a satisfying assignment and construct a Hamiltonian path. Okay. And then conversely, I'm going to try to argue that if I had a Hamiltonian path here, then there will be a satisfying assignment here. And so first I'd argue that, oh, a Hamiltonian path has to have this high-level framework of generally choosing only one direction along each, each rung. That one is like an extra sentence or two. It's, it's done a little more carefully in the notes. Once I have that, then I know, okay, it's of some form where it's going, it's visiting, it's going, and it's visiting, and stuff like this. And I say, okay, so based on the directions, that'll be my assignment. And I know it's a satisfying clause because it's visiting those intermediate things. Okay. So if you do it carefully, you write it all out, you will show that yes means yes. It is satisfiable means there is a Hamiltonian path. And that there is a Hamiltonian path means it is satisfiable. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Hamiltonian path, just to visit this guy, this person, would have to do one of the two directions correctly. Yeah, but but this is this is exactly the same as saying that this clause forces either x1 to be true or x2 to be false. It's also constraining us. And the hard part is that there's all these constraints at the same time. It's not clear we can satisfy all the constraints. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so, uh, and you're still welcome to interrupt with questions, but what we've shown is that, okay, given a, given a formula, I can construct a graph where there's a Hamiltonian path if and only if there's a satisfying assignment. So this black box that's just looking for a long path can actually solve a SAT formula. Okay. So graphs are also very expressive. That's what this is saying, especially with this path constraint. I mean, you can see where the fact that we require a path is very useful. This, this thing where you have to visit each vertex exactly once. Okay. All right. All right, I'll force you to vote one more time. So this was the murkiest vote originally. So DAGs turned out to be easy. That was the simplest case. Directed graphs turned out to be quite hard. That's the most general case. Undirected graphs could be in the middle. Okay. So certainly a directed graph would solve an undirected graph, but not necessarily vice versa. So the question is, is the undirected graph going to behave more like a DAG or a directed graph? Okay. So first, who's not going to vote? Okay, we'll see. Uh, who thinks we can get an algorithm for this? Okay. And who thinks it's going to turn out to be hard? Oh, that's pretty good. Good job, guys. Still a few of you, but much better. Okay. Um, okay. We're going to try to show it is hard. Okay. We could do the same Hamiltonian path problem or something like that. Okay. Now, if I want to show undirected graph is hard, what would be a good candidate? 
problem to work from. So if I can show that the undirected graph problem, longest path and undirected graph or something, can solve the directed version. Oh, I just gave it away. OK. <laughs> OK. So, so now that we've shown this one is hard, a directed graph, then it's an obvious candidate to try to show undirected is hard. So if we can find some trick where undirected graphs can capture directed graphs, uh, then in fact, undirected graphs will also turn out to be just as expressive, just as difficult to work with when it comes to these path problems. Okay. All right. Um, any ideas? I think we have an ideas slide. Any ideas? Okay, I, so I can duplicate the graph, duplicate vertices. Uh, good thing we have a button called duplicate. Okay, I've duplicated. Okay, okay, so let me, okay, let's say I have something like a vertex here. This is just like one part of the graph. These are some vertices it goes to. These are some vertices it goes to. So what should I do with this? Okay, so I think what I have in mind is probably pretty similar. I think we're gonna finish early today, which is a miracle. Uh, okay, so what we can do is we can take each vertex and we can split it up. So this is this would this used to be the one vertex. And I'm gonna call one V in, like I'm going into the vertex. I'm gonna call this one V out, like I'm leaving the vertex and add an edge in the middle. Okay. So if you come into VN, you have to go to V out. Um, actually, we can make this even better. Uh, if I'm worried about Hamiltonian path, I'll add one more vertex in the middle that you have to visit, just in case you're worried about going like this and like this later. Okay. So if I add an extra vertex in the middle, then I know that once I hit VN, I have to go all the way through to V out. Otherwise, I'll never get this middle vertex. It's probably necessary. Okay, and then out will actually take what used to be a directed edge to the inversion of another vertex, inversion of another vertex, inversion of another vertex. Okay, so that's the exciting. Uh, that's that's the idea. Okay is that we're gonna split the vertices and add something in the middle to force you to, to use the auxiliary thing. Okay, so yeah, the construction will look something like this. Um, and now if you, if you look for the Hamiltonian path in the undirected graph, okay, if there is a Hamiltonian path in a directed graph, like you're going from here to here, then you should just follow that direction's a little more straightforward. And conversely, if you have an undirected graph, it's like first you have to point out that okay, any Hamiltonian path has to have this same form where it's always going some ver out to in to intermediate to out to in to intermediate. That's the only way to hit the inner the middle vertices. Once you establish that that any Hamiltonian path has to have this form, then it's very easy to read off, right? Oh, v, d, e, whatever is the next vertex. And you can show, okay, that's visiting all the vertices. Okay. You do have to be a little bit careful to argue that any Hamiltonian path has to have exactly the structure we expect, which is why we need to add one more vertex just to force it to do this. Okay. Uh, any questions? I didn't expect to finish early. Uh, 
Okay, we can finish or, or you know, you have five minutes. You can do anything you want. All right, that's all I have for today. So uh, I'll see you guys Monday where we do something else fun, I'm sure. Okay, thanks guys.